Welcome to the last video in this series on Christian Symbolism in the Zodiac, Part 5. In this video, we'll talk about scriptures and related symbolism in the constellations Gemini, Cancer, and Leo. If you missed Part 1, you can watch that video for a brief overview of all 12 Zodiac and an introduction to this topic. Now let's start with Gemini. Gemini is Latin for twins. As I studied this sign, I came across various takes, and I think there could be various explanations for it. Interestingly, the two brightest stars in Gemini, Castor and Pollux, are directly referenced in the New Testament. It says, After three months we put out to the sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship, with the figurehead of the twin gods Castor and Pollux. Unfortunately, that didn't give me much to go off of because it was nothing more than a direct reference to these characters. So there wasn't any obvious symbolism that stood out to me right away. Here are three suggestions I came across while studying Gemini. Throughout scripture, Christ is depicted as a groom and the church as his bride. Just as we are commanded that a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall be one flesh, so too can we become united with Christ through repentance and obedience to his laws. This connection, based on this scripture, is not very clear to me when I first read it, because a bride and groom are a little different than twins. Although I have heard it said that married couples tend to look more alike over time, plus unity is the goal for a godly marriage. See Ephesians 5 verses 24-31. Now, another source suggested that Gemini represents the two natures of Christ, or his twin role as Son of God and Son of Man. See Matthew 24, verses 27 and 30, and Luke chapter 1, verse 35. I think that's a good interpretation, but for me, the dual roles of Christ was addressed with more nuance in other signs of the zodiac. So I kept looking. A final source pointed towards the twin loaves of leavened bread which are offered at the temple on the day of the first fruits of the field, or Pentecost. See Leviticus 23 verse 17. What was the significance of the twin loaves? First, these loaves were supposed to be prepared with leaven, or yeast, so they were risen. This points us to Christ's parable in Matthew chapter 13 of the kingdom of heaven which is prepared with leaven. See Matthew 13 verse 33. A little bit of leaven makes the whole dough rise. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 6. In other words, we are the leaven, and as we become disciples of Christ, we can influence those around us for good too. As Paul tells the Corinthians, don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, from the New International Version. Gradually, this way, we can prepare the world for the kingdom of God and become the first fruits unto God. See Revelations chapter 14, verse 4. This first fruits offering of leavened bread was to be offered fresh unto God rather than burnt on the altar. See Leviticus chapter 2, verse 12. This image reminds us of what we discussed in the last video regarding Taurus. Unlike the tares, the good wheat is to be saved from the burning of the field and raised up unto the Lord. The significance of there being two loaves could represent the gospel going both to the Jews and to the Gentiles. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. I think each of these explanations are valid. However, I've saved my favorite interpretation for last. I think Gemini is a direct reference to the relationship between Christ and his church, but more specifically, Christ and Adam. This seems to connect to the idea of actual twins the best. The Greek word for Castor and Pollux that's used in Acts 28 is Dioscorei. It comes from dios or diopetes, meaning fallen from heaven, and koros being the plural of boy. So we get the picture of two boys fallen from heaven, which could refer to Adam and Christ. Adam was the first who fell because of Satan the deceiver, and then Christ descended 
rather than fell, in order to bring back and redeem the first. This line of thinking is confirmed by a synopsis of the Greek tradition for Gemini. It was said that Pollux asked Zeus to share his own immortality with his twin to keep them together, and they were transformed into the constellation Gemini. Pollux was said to be Zeus's son, while Castor's father was immortal and also the king of Sparta. The story of an immortal wanting to share his godhood with his brother parallels the story of Genesis. Christ did, after all, come to earth and live and die in righteousness that us, his brothers and sisters, may live again in immortality. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. By every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. Castor and Pollux are even often depicted on horses, which as mentioned in a previous video, may symbolize the quickening of the resurrection. This also ties back to the twin loaves, which were specifically to be leavened bread, which again has that same theme of being risen, quickened, or resurrected. To further solidify this twin symbolism, I'll use two more scriptures. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And 1 John chapter 3 verse 2, Beloved, now, as we are sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In short, Gemini tells us that we are made in God's image and can become like Christ when he returns if we choose to follow him. The next sign, Cancer, is Latin for crab. Greek mythology tells a similar story to what we discussed about the scorpion. It was said that while Hercules battled the Hydra, he was attacked in the heel by a crab, which Hercules then crushes. Following that line of thinking, the crab may once again represent Christ, bruised by death, yet his subsequent victory. However, the crab can tell us even more about Christ. Unlike the scorpion, crabs live on both land and in water. Again, that's a representation of Christ's dual nature of being able to descend below the grave and then live again. One source recommended the fiddler crab as an ideal image for this symbol because the fiddler crab has one large and exceptionally powerful pincer, which represents the strength of Christ's hand. He descended into the spirit prison to bring forth the captives with his firm grasp such that no one can pluck them out of his hand. See John 10 verse 28. there is similar symbolism found elsewhere in this constellation. For example, in the heart of this constellation is an open star cluster with the traditional name of Priusipi, which is Latin for enclosure, stall, manger, or hive. This brings to mind the image of a place where livestock gather for nourishment and safety. Acts 20 verse 28 says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. One of Cancer's stars is named Al-Tarf, which is Arabic for the end. We know from scripture that in the end, or last days, Christ will gather together all things in one. See Ephesians 1 verse 10 and Isaiah 11 verse 12. His church is his flock that gather around the manger, not coincidentally, the birthplace of the Savior. There will be one fold and one shepherd, John 1 verse 16. Today, Priusipi is also called the beehive cluster, which is another image of a place of gathering. In short, the crab represents Christ's descent below all to purchase and bring us forth with his mighty hand so that we can gather together in Zion in righteousness. Finally, we come to Leo, which is Latin for lion. The lion is traditionally a symbol for the Israelite tribe of Judah. Jacob's blessing to his son Judah references both a lion and the second coming of Christ. See Genesis chapter 49, verse 9 and 10. Isaiah 31 compares the triumphant return of the Lord like as the lion roaring on his prey, 
And Revelations chapter 5, verse 5 says, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seven seals thereof. This scripture is referencing Christ in relation to the last days. A lion is also the traditional symbol for kingship or royalty, especially in England where it is thought that Christ's disciples fled. Christ, the Lion of Judah, will return again to earth and rule with power and glory and destroy Satan and his followers and usher in the millennial reign of peace and righteousness. Then the wolf and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 25. The brightest star in Leo is Regulus, which is Latin for little king. And that brings us right back to where we started. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted, his God is with us. And when he was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born, king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. So there you go. That's the story of Christ as it is written in the stars. Truly all things testify of Christ, and all things are created by his hand. We have seen the testimony of Christ in the stars, corroborated by the testimony of him in the Holy Scriptures. I hope you found this study enlightening, and please share if you have more to add. Below I will list some books, sources, and additional scriptures, as well as my favorite resources on this topic, such as blueletterbible.org, biblehub.com, and scriptures.byu.edu. Keep learning, and remember to smile.